Hi, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Fabrizio Salzano uh, presenting for Product School. Let me start introducing myself quickly. I'm uh, clearly an Italian professional from accent, a computer scientist by background and a passionate e-commerce uh, in a bit uh, testing. I am also, also became recently proud daddy too. Let me skip quickly to what is my experience. And I am a travel professional uh, for more than 16 years, currently working at Booking.com. And prior to that, I've uh, been part of the Expedia company. I run more than 500 A-B tests. And that's why today we're going to talk about why you can always A-B test. Or as I say, in the line, a quick guide to A-B testing and more. Now, let me start uh, saying that this will be a very practical presentation. For those looking for an intro to A-B testing, and it's possible alternatives if A-B testing is really not on the table. Now, everything starts with the definition or common sense based, as I say, definition of A-B testing. A-B testing is, uh, to the core, a quick way to check in with your users to see what they really think about a feature or a change that you come up with. Why A-B testing? There are at least three reasons I can think of. The first one is that nobody can predict the future and not even your boss. The second is that it's a good way to democratize learning and decisions. What I mean here is that giving exposure of how users react to your change enables everyone, regardless of their pay grade, of uh, uh, making a decision about the data. And third, this also enables you to have progressive learnings given the nature of A-B testing and a small steps approach. Let me tell you what are the building blocks of A-B testing. Uh, so there are at least five main building blocks. There is an hypothesis, KPIs, type of test, the setup, and the runtime or sample size. Let's go through them one by one, starting from the hypothesis. The hypothesis is composed of four elements. What do you want to change? You can say those are the features uh, that you are testing. Who is exposed to the change? Your users, eh? or user segment more specifically. What is the effect on the user that you expect or a behavioral change? Last not least, what do you, how do you measure the impact of the change? Typically KPIs. Let me give you an example. Eh? So let's say that you are adding a shopping cart on every page. Your user is all the returning customers. And the behavioral change will be for them to find with more ease the visited and bookmarked properties. KPIs that probably you want to test is an increase in bookers, multi-destination bookings, and cart interactions. This is what actually hypothesis would look like, one way. Second is KPIs. You can, think, can categorize KPIs in three buckets. Primary is actually the one that you lose, help you in making a decision. Secondary or supporting, usually those are behavior KPIs, how the, how the users are interacting with your product. And last but not least, health metrics. Usually those are the metrics related to the system. Now here, the first tip. It is important to define, in my opinion, for every experiment that you run, all of the above. So primary, secondary, and health metrics. And try to agree and keep that agreement and, and this consistency within your organization. So do not keep changing your KPIs every time unless it's strictly necessary. This will make your strategy much, much stronger. Give me, let me give you an example. Again, the case of the uh, cart. <clears throat> the primary, again, business metric will be net bookers. The secondary or supporting uh, is the amount of users accessing the card. So that's a behavioral uh, metric. And the health metrics in this case, let's say those are system metrics. What is the uptime or the page load? Let's go on the third block, which is the topology of tests. Uh, this is a bit of a technical topic, but what is really important for you to know is there are three types of tests. A superiority test, which means that you expect your change to be better than what currently your customers are exposed to. A non-inferiority test, which means that your change will not be worse than what you're offering today to the customers. And sometimes you also define by how much will not be worse. So what is the acceptable cost? And 
for your you know knowledge it's also the third topology is, is equivalence test the equivalence test is when it says it's not better but it's not worse it's really not that frequent to run this type of test now the tip of this section uh, section is the following do choose a non-inferiority test for those changes need to happen so think in terms of uh, 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 strategic value changes uh, like uh, in technology there is a lot of replatforming uh, so if replatforming needs to happen there is no point in, in opening for a superiority test and you know inferiority test will be will do it otherwise always go for a superiority test the reason being that i don't imagine why you shouldn't really offer a better experience a better product every time and over time to your users number four test setup Here's a bit of the bulk of the tests. Uh, here you can define how many uh, variations uh, of your change you want to offer to the customers, uh, which cohort of users you're tracking, et cetera, et cetera. A couple of tips here. First of all, be aware of false positives. Now, uh, a false positive means that uh, you see an impact where actually there is none. Uh, so your metrics turn out in, in, to be conclusive in one direction, in the positive direction, also they, they, it's a false, uh, it's not true. Now, this is much more common if you keep running consecutive tests, uh, keeping base, uh, not changing base and keeping testing small variation of whatever is your, uh, uh, your feature. So it's much better to pack all the variations in one experiment and run it if you can, if you have the power in as a one single experiment. If you don't have the power to do this kind of experiment with many variations, then choose one variation and stick to it. The second thing, do design the test for decision-making and not only on based on what you can do. So basically what this means is that based on the data that your product test will produce, you should be able to already know what to do next. Now, last not least is runtime and sample size. Uh, it's important to really calculate how many users will need to be exposed to your change in order to de detect a significant impact on your main KPIs. The tip here is to always, always, always calculate the minimum sample size. It is not true that more data is always the better. Uh, and there is plenty of online calculators to do that. Now, there are some instances where actually you cannot A-B test. Uh, you can think of uh, you are introducing uh, too much friction to your users. Uh? Or let me put this differently. There are some instances where you should not A-B test. So first case is you are introducing too much friction to your users. Think of uh, those B2B users. Uh, in our case, we uh, .com, it works in the accommodation business. I season, our partners, usually in summertime are very busy with the... Um, operational efforts, you could say. Distracting them or disrupting them with A-B testing is usually not a good, uh, a good idea. Another reason not to A-B test is when to test for the sake of testing. Eh? So you don't have a clear hypothesis or no idea on how to use the test results. Eh? Back to uh, designing tests for decision making. Um, and the last is for moral reasons, right? You shouldn't A-B test. Uh, testing a dark pattern. Think of the situation of hiding valuable information from your users. But I would say you should never apply this change in general, not only via be testing. Now, what if you actually you cannot be test instead? And I can think of a few reasons. The most obvious, you lack the be testing platform or the test itself is too expensive. Eh? Sometimes uh, testing some features can be really expensive for business, so they cannot afford it. The second most common is usually when you don't have enough users, a small sample size. The implication of having a small sample size means that your test might take too, too long, months, uh, maybe to reach, uh, reach conclusions, maybe never. <clears throat> the third, you don't have the product yet, so you have nothing really to offer. And last, but it is very like un uncommon, is actually that the change you have in mind is really not good fit for the A-B testing methodology. Now, what are you going to do eh? if you fall in any of these buckets or other reasons that push you to not really use a bit testing? Let me introduce you to the pyramid of evidence. What the pyramid of evidence uh, uh, refers to is the fact that the base 
on the type of methodology that you choose to produce an evidence, you can actually stack them up and uh, each layer will be qualitatively better than the layer before. So for instance, uh, we know that randomized test or A-B testing is usually superior to an expert opinion, but this is kind of intuitive. Now, uh, another uh, takeaway from the pyramid of evidence is that not only we know that there is a, a, an increase in quality of each methodology, but there also there is usually, in my experience, an increase in cost. Uh, now, uh, if you work in, in, uh, in the tech industry, now gathering an expert opinion, it costs usually nothing. Uh, running a randomized test usually costs money, or at least the investment in DB testing infrastructure, you know, the time of a developer. Let me then walk you through each level to give you some alternatives in case you don't have a B testing. I will not discuss meta reviews because meta reviews is actually a reviewing a set of randomized tests. Very few companies can afford to do that. Uh, this means having a lot of A-B testing uh, of the same typology or around the same topic. So we will not, I will not comment about that. So let's start from uh, randomized tests. So A-B testing, where we talked about it, this is where actually Booking.com uh, sits and is actually champion of. A few things to keep in mind uh, while I think about A-B testing uh, and also I would say best practices. It is good idea to always test a single change at a time. This, the reason for that is because if you test multiple things at a time, you don't really know what is the contribution of each change to the KPIs that you're measuring. The second is, again, good practice to focus on a fast delivery, means like roll out the test quickly and make the test again small so that actually you can learn fast and then reiterate on the learnings from the test. And this actually also introduced the third uh, uh, tip, iterate continuously, keep iterating to keep improving your products, but beware of false positive. We mentioned what false positive is and they're way more common than you think. Now, slightly less qualitatively uh, um, than uh, a randomized test, there is a, a, um, a court research. Now, what is a court research? A court research means that we are uh, investigating how uh, different courts, you can think of uh, different groups of users, multiple groups of users with similar attributes, uh, behave with regard to a specific feature. Uh, you can think of those, an example of uh, two courts, like maybe um, users that uh, that uh, like oranges and users that like apples. Uh, so you isolate those two cohorts and usually you analyze um, how they behave with regard to buying fruits as a feature. Now, this is a, a, a the word research usually implies that is an observational study. You don't really, uh, uh, you don't really experiment on the user. You're just observing how they behave. And uh, typically comes without uh, randomization. So you're not really randomizing uh, how the court is composed. You're actually following a specific court of users that has a specific attributes. So it's actually quite biased. So again, there is no intervention or no experimentation, just observation, no randomization. Uh, so you can identify what is called a correlation uh, between the user and the behavior, but not really causation. Now, what this means in practice, uh, how you can call, run a court uh, research usually in, a, in an e-commerce business by running user research interviews. Uh, so you identify your bucket of users and then you ask them questions about specific feature or behavior that they are um, showing. Now, one step below that, there is the case research. Now, what the case research is uh, usually uh, again, word research, so it's an observational study, is more uh, when you can think of a user individual or a group of individuals that submit a specific report. Eh? It's also called uh, uh, case reports. Now, again, a little bit less qualitatively, uh, less than court research, first of all, in volumes. Eh? It's not group of users, but single users. Same observation, no randomization attributes. An example of a case research, again, in e-commerce or many business today, is comes from um, 
customer service tickets or guest reviews. So by analyzing them, you actually are researching uh, through those cases to mine some learnings. One step below, and this is, I think is as obvious as it gets, is the expert opinion. Now, expert opinion, I won't dismiss them too quickly. Um, of course, you have to keep in mind they can be heavily biased eh, because it's how you, we came from randomized tests to group of users, uh, court research, to single reports, which is the case research, to a single user, eh, really asking uh, an expert opinion. Uh, it is a fire starter, not the end. So it is good to trigger questions, but I won't say is the end destination. An example, again, eh, uh, spelling out the obvious, uh, you could interview or engage with a business craft expert that is promoting an idea. I do think that they can they have their place and their time if you find the right individuals. Now, you could argue that what the pyramid of evidence is saying is that the higher you climb, the better is the view. Is that the case? Eh? So uh, you everybody should do meta reviews if you want or randomized tests. Why would you ever go to a court case or expert level? Now, there are at least a couple of reasons, right? We also mentioned them uh, during this, uh, in this uh, uh, talk. The first one is that A-B test, testing can be quite expensive. Eh? Again, as we said, the platform itself or the test. The second reason is that A-B testing is not always advisable, not technically possible. And, and this is back to where we are talking about when not to A-B test, uh, where, where you are not able to A-B test. Now, what is the pyramid of evidence really telling us? It's telling us that every approach has downsides and limitations. Now, how you interact with this downsides and limitations is up to you. What this means is that you can choose the right approach based on your context. And so what is the level of tech and quality level that you aim for or you can afford? And the second thing that is less obvious is that ideally you should walk the entirety of the um, pyramid of evidence bottom to top. Think of combining every layer, again, bottom up, to build knowledge. So you can think of progressively uh, invest in a higher level of quality or you know, technology investment, starting from uh, an expert opinion. Then this could give you a lead into maybe analyzing some, uh, uh, starting a case research. This case research potentially could lead you to identifying cohorts of users that expose the behavior that you're looking for. The insights from a court research could lead you to design an A-B test that allow you to give you the ultimate form of validation. Now, one last remark before you know, closing this talk, and you might have heard this you know, left and right. Now, correlations doesn't imply causation. With correlation, we mean the two events happen at the same time. Uh, causation means that one event is causing the other. And now I love always to use this picture, right? We have this cat sitting on this roof, bent exactly in the spot where the cat is. Clearly the cat didn't produce the bend in the pillar. And this is exactly the point. There is correlation, the cat and the bend are you know, showing uh, at the same uh, time, but there is no causation. So the cat didn't cause the, uh, uh, the bend. Why I'm saying that is because in the alternatives that we'll be testing uh, that I uh, talked to you about, there is a correlation. So there is an indication of two events happening at the same time, but there is no causation. It's, I'm not saying that one event is, cause, is causing the other. So be mindful in every non-randomized uh, um, methodology that you apply to not really make the mistake of a confusing correlation with causation. And that's all, folks. Thank you very much for your time.